that was published last year. Um, I and a few others fed into it, which is very much his piece of work. Um, and we were going to launch it at the conference last year if the Queen hadn't inconsiderately died uh, two weeks too early. Um, so, but you can find it online on the website, newliberalmanifesto.org.uk. I do encourage you to read it. I think it's a really good piece of work. And Chris's concern in writing it and getting some of the uh, rest of us to feed into it was that the party seemed to have no clear message. It wasn't clear what the Liberal Democrats stood for and what liberalism in 2022, 2023 uh, was all about. So that's the background of this meeting. Do look at it. Um, and uh, the New Liberal Manifesto is the organisation that's hosting this meeting. Uh, that's fine for me. I'll hand over to Leila. Thank you. Right. Hi, everyone. It's wonderful. Of course, this was going to be packed, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. We all want to be doing better. And so my job here is to chair, to keep the peace to shepherd the conversation, um, but first and foremost to introduce our two fabulous speakers. Um, so we start with Sir John Curtis, a god. <laughs> a <mother laughs> <of the people>. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. How many of us have sat with him? at 3 a.m. <laughs> watching the scores come in, knowing that we're part of a very niche, niche group of people. <laughs> um, John is Professor of Politics at the University of Strathclyde and Senior Research Fellow at the National Centre for Social Research. He's probably the UK's best known sophologist and frequently appears on the BBC during the broadcast coverage of general elections. Um, and so he will be presenting to us a critical evaluation of where we stand as a party, he'll take about 20 minutes to do so. Uh, and then immediately afterwards, uh, I will be throwing the floor open to Lord Dick Newby, um, who is the leader of the Liberal Democrats in the House of Lords since 2016. <coughs> he also chairs the Federal Policy Committee's manifesto working group, preparing drafts that are fed into the pre-manifesto, which we're of course debating in this conference and that I'll be introducing. Um, and he will be shepherding us through that manifesto making uh, process. So, without further ado, I think we should get cracking, shouldn't we? So, John Curtis. Uh, thank you very much, Leila. Uh, none of this academic sophology ever been so popular. Before. <laughs> um, in the right place. <laughs> but before I begin on the main business, can I just acknowledge? with you, and I think Mark Pack did this this morning, the death of Michael Steed, who was the former president of this party, and who is, happens to be the first person with whom I collaborated academically, uh, beginning back in 1979. Um, Michael was a brilliant um, intellectual geographer from whom I learned a great deal. I have no idea whether he would agree or disagree with what I've got to say this afternoon, but I suspect somewhere up there he's probably keeping an eye on what's going on. Anyway. Um, the, the, the broad structure of what I'm going to talk about, though these are not four equal parts. So I want to look first of all at the obvious question, well, how well or badly is the party doing? From that, I'm going to move in a little bit of dis consideration of discussion of the prospects for tactical voting, and particularly, obviously, anti-conservative tactical voting, and what might be the implications of that for this party. I then want to look at what, at least a couple of pieces of evidence on the, what, to what extent is it the case that the Liberal Democrats are doing better in the kinds of places in which they claim to be doing better. Um, and then I'm going to move in, because this happens to be one of my specialist subjects at the moment, to look at uh, the patterns of party support and attitudes towards Brexit and how that's evolved during the course of uh, the last four years. So that's broadly the agenda. So. Uh, this is a summary of all of the opinion polls since the last general election. It's been a very unusual parliament. Usually we expect the government to be popular for a while after the election and then it becomes unpopular and the opposition moves ahead. And then maybe or maybe not, uh, the government gets back again by the time of the election. Uh, this is a remarkable parliament because for the first two years the opposition were never ahead of the Conservatives in the opinion polls. Um, but in the wake of one party gate and two Liz Trust, we are now in a position where we have something like an 18-point uh, Labour lead. But the grey line, rather further down the graph, is the summary of where you are at. And basically what I would say to you, at the moment you're averaging 11%, you have never been higher in the whole of this parliament 
that in the national opinion polls than the 12% that you got back in 2019. Um, now, you can argue that even the 92-97 parliament, you were ahead of your 18% baseline for much of that parliament, but you were ahead for a while, and of course you were at least operating for a much higher baseline. So, and in particular, you know, one obvious question that immediately rises is, why is it that apparently it has been the Labour Party, almost entirely, with a little, with a little bit of reform UK as well, who have been the people who have been profiting from the Conservative travails, whereas your party has seemingly not. Um, what might be underlying this? And what I'm looking at here, I'm this is using the most recent polls, to look at um, what's uh, happened to uh, support in and out of the party. So um, let's just go to the far right-hand side first. 61% um, of people who said they voted Liberal Democrat 2019, on average in the polls, are saying they would vote for the party again. Now, um, you've lost a few votes to the Tories, but not surprisingly, not very many. But you will notice around a quarter of the votes that the party had in 2019 have gone to Labour. And that's something I'm going to be coming back to more than once in the course of this talk. Um, yes, you have picked up some votes off the Conservatives, about 6% of the Conservative votes gone to you. But basically that for every one vote you've picked up from the Conservatives, Labour have picked up three. Um, and um, yes, you've picked up a few votes from the Democrats, but it's, it's relatively small beer. So in net terms, you've been gaining ground from the Conservatives, surprise, surprise. But you've also been losing ground to Labour. And I guess that raises one obvious question, is whether this party has spent so much time focusing on the Conservative Party that it's perhaps forgotten that we are actually a multi-party system and that there are two opposition parties who are also competing with each other for votes in some circumstances. Now, what might this mean in terms of uh, an outcome in terms of seats? Now, look, this is frankly, it's not arithmetic, and I can give you all sorts of reasons why the outcome might be like this. But this is just simply saying, well, what would be happen if the rises and falls in party support since 2019 were to happen in each and every constituency, okay? And basically, I can get you to 30, which is not bad, but your basic, that your, your, why are you at 30? Not because you're making progress, you are simply benefiting from the fact that the Conservative vote is down and in some places, therefore, you might end up, end up winning. But notice in particular, that would not be sufficient for you to reclaim the mantle of third place in the House of Commons, although, of course, we might want to talk about the position in Scotland in our, our Q&A. But there's then also one other thing to bear about when we start uh, thinking about the fact that this is a party that's saying, well, let's focus on the places where we are second to the Conservatives, that's where we can gain ground. I think one of the things you have to be aware of is that the fact that Labour have made progress in the national polls and you have not potentially significantly limits the seats in which you might be able to profit from anti-conservative tactical voting, about which I'm going to say more in a moment. What I've done here is to do that same noddy projection, but now I've said, well, if the Liberal Democrat vote more in a stage where it was in 2019, the Labour vote is up by 12% or so, in how many seats do the Democrats still remain second to the Conservatives? And that number, you know, you've got 80 or so at the moment, you look, 32 of those seats are ones where now you would expect Labour to be ahead of you in that constituency. So you're basically down to about 50 seats in which at the moment, given your national poll position, you appear to be potentially electorally competitive with the Conservatives. That's the opinion polls. Now, of course, these are not the only measures of party performance. One is the local elections back in May. Um, and I think no, one thing I think one can acknowledge, I mean, this is uh, done on the basis of the sample results collected by the BBC at the time, from which we attempt to estimate what would have happened if the whole country had had the chance to vote in local elections at that time. And yes, I think, you know, just about the performance in May this year rec constitutes a record performance uh, at any time since the party entered into coalition with the Conservatives in 2010. <coughs> Though I think one also has to say that the progress was incremental and wasn't that much better than May 2019, when you'll remember the Conservatives also had a wee bit of trouble under Theresa May, um, or indeed uh, in May of the previous year. Although the other striking thing about the local elections is Labour did not do as well as they anticipated. That said, 
these kinds of numbers are still well below what you're recording in similar projections before the 2010 election. And that, uh, for, for about 10, 15 years or so, you were regularly bouncing at around the 25 point mark. So even in local elections, you are still not back <laughs> up to where you were. Of course, the really striking success has been in parliamentary by-elections. You've managed to win four. Labour's got a few more friends inside the House of Commons. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and that is the best record uh, in parliamentary by-elections for this party since the 92 to 97 Parliament, when you also have picked up four seats. And here, I mean, the, 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 the tactical position has been spectacular. I've confined myself here to the by-elections since the Conservatives fell down in the polls, i.e. since December 21. But, you know, I mean, their vote is collapsing uh, quite spectacularly. And, you know, in the seats where Labour were deemed to be competitive, they were up, you were down, you were clearly being squeezed. But conversely, in the seats that you were deemed to be competitive, then you were well up, whereas um, uh, the Labour Party was being squeezed. So you can very, very strong evidence that in the context of parliamentary by-election, uh, there are indeed plenty of people out there who are willing to use whatever stick is available locally to beat the Conservatives. But you then have to ask yourself the question, to what extent is the evidence of parliamentary by-elections translatable to what might happen in a general election? And for that, I think the local elections probably provide a better guide. And certainly, they're, they're much closer to the kind of tactical voting that we saw in the 1997 general election, when we also had a lot of anti-conservative tactical voting. Now, Point one, this is now comparing uh, what happened between the change in votes since May 2019 and May 2023, uh, broken down by which party was second to the Conservatives in May 2019. And what you will note on the right hand side is that if you do the analysis that way, you're basically not doing particularly well in what are supposedly meant to be the kinds of places where you might do well. For example, the Dems are in grey. Yes, sorry, the Lib Dems are in grey. The, uh, the yellow are the, are the green. Sorry, that's just my... <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the law of big dates, okay? Um, in, order to, but in order to identify... But that, that's not to say that you didn't profit from tactical voting local elections, but it comes back to the point I was making earlier. The fact that Labour have advanced and you haven't meant that the wards in which you were profiting for tactical voting were a much smaller group. They were essentially, as you can see, what, what I've now done in this slide is do the same analysis, but it's now changed since the, pre, the May of last year. I'm breaking it down by who was second in 2022, which is a smaller group of wards than the wards in which you were second in May 2019. Now you can see the anti-conservative tactical voting from which you are profiting, and equally Labour also doing relatively well in the seats uh, where, where they were starting off second. But again, you can see how the fact that if indeed voters, even if you were second in the past, have gotten on to the fact that maybe you are no longer second locally, then people are not necessarily going to use you with the stick with beat with its beat conservatives. Then also you note. Know, now, one's expectations of you know, how much tactical voting is likely to occur, I mean, it's not inconsiderable by historical standards, but you know, we're talking about both you and the Labour Party doing three, four points better on average in places where you're starting off second. And that is pretty consistent with what we saw in the 97 uh, general election. Um, and again, I mean, this again uh, reiterates the same, the, the same point about how it's very much in wards where you were second mm that the tactical voting uh, was uh, kicking in. So what I've then done is to use the evidence of the local elections and say, well, let's assume, uh, again, I'm using my standard not arithmetic, but I'm now saying in constituencies where Labour are, are starting off second, we'll assume that, you know, that they benefit from about 3 4% tactical voting. And you also benefit similarly in the wards where you are second. Okay? And I think this is a reasonably realistic interpretation. Now it pushes you up. So my figure of 30 now goes up to 37, but it only goes up to 37. And depending on the fate of the SNP north of the border, you might still not be the third party in the House of Commons. So, I mean, uh, 
Picking up some seats off, uh, through tactical voting by historical standards is a relatively large number, but I think it's probably a much more realistic <coughs> number, uh, given even the current levels of conservative uh, uh, unpopularity, than the kinds of levels of uh, uh, tactical voting we saw in parliamentary by-elections. Now, <clears throat> what evidence is there more broadly that the party is indeed doing better than my standard <coughs> arithmetic assumption that you're basically just going to hold your own in seats where you are second or maybe a bit, a bit of tactical voting. Is the parties uh, advancing in places where we might <coughs> think it would do so? Neither of these analyses is perfect, but within the limitations of data available, this is pretty much what we've got. Um, uh, Redfield and Wilton are regularly, kind of pretty much every fortnight, doing polls in what they call the Blue Wall. Now, the Blue Wall is not what you would call the Blue Wall. Half of them are actually seats where the Labour Party are second. But at least half of them are seats where you are second. And to that extent, at least, you know, if you were advancing your broad general poll position more strongly in places where you are breathing down the Conservatives' neck, apparently, <laughs> It, there at least should be some evidence in this, uh, in this de these data that you are doing more strongly than you are in the doing the national opinion polls, but you're not. Okay, Redfield and Wilton's recent Red Blue Wall polls has you down two in these in these seats as compared with the minus one in the national polls. The second thing I've been able to do, and this is using the British Election Study, which is a big uh, had a big fifteen thousand wave um, not long after um, the demise of Liz Truss. Um, and what I've done here is, so the, 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 the blue bars are the changes GB wide in, in this particular survey. And it has to be said, this particular survey was uh, unusually a bad result overall for you. So it's, it's got you down to 7%. We don't necessarily take that possible, but the crucial point is what's the difference between what this survey was saying about your national position and what it says of what's going on in seats where you were second to the Conservatives. And because this survey is a 15,000 survey, I've got enough people in constituencies where the Conservatives were first, Liberal Democrats were second to be able to do this. And as you can see, basically nothing doing. Your vote's down more. And again, one of the things you have to remember, it's already probably the case in quite a lot of these constituencies, you are already reliant on having squeezed the Labour vote. And it's often the case in polls down in the middle of the Parliament, that that kind of unravels, so it's not necessarily minus 11. But remember, therefore, you might be starting a general election campaign having to squeeze back Labour voters in these seats even before you can hope to make any further progress. OK, now on to the question of Brexit. Um, this is a running average of all of the opinion polls uh, about whether how people would vote on the EU. In the early period, some of them are still remain and leave, but you know, in the last 12, 18 months, they're all about rejoin versus stay out. Uh, and the, these are all the opinion polls conducted since the conclusion of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement at the end of 2020. The grey line is the, uh, the, the don't knows are taken up. The grey line are those people who say they would vote to rejoin, and the orange line are those who say they would vote to stay up. You will see that in the wake of the immediate conclusion of the TCA, there was a big sigh of relief that we weren't going off the edge of the cliff, and we got back to basically 52% saying we should be outside the EU and 48% saying we should be inside. <coughs> but gradually, beginning in the autumn of 2021, public opinion has, has shifted. What happened in the autumn of 2021? Those were the first stories about the lack, alleged lack of lorry drivers to deliver petrol and to fill supermarket shelves uh, because apparently we didn't have nothing coming from the EU, the lack of abattoir workers uh, to deal with pigs, etc. This was the first time that bad news about Brexit hit the media. And you can see how it moved. You can then also see that it moved in the summer and autumn of 2022 if you remember what happened in the summer in the autumn of 2022, there was a certain Tory leadership contest which ended up with the uh, demise of Liz Truss. Um, and I suspect it's almost undoubtedly true that another, that while, uh, that, while I'm not going to argue that the reason why the Conservatives are in trouble is because of Brexit, it's clearly not the case. It's Johnson and Truss that's the reason. But it's probably true that the demise of Liz Truss also boosted support for rejoining. In other words, the loss of confidence in, in the economic confidence of the party to deliver Brexit also helped to undermine support for Brexit. That said, you should be aware that the reason why the polls are where they are 
this isn't just simply Leave voters changing their minds. It's that's some of it. Leave voters are now somewhat loyal to their side of the argument than are Remain voters. It's also that the people who did not vote in 2016 are many of whom, of course, were too young, are overwhelmingly pro-rejoin and have been for a very long time. Yeah. Now, what one can then do with all of the, all of this stuff is to say, well, what's happened to party support? Uh, breaking it down uh, by uh, people's stance on the EU. Now, this is the conventional way of doing it. So we take the way in which people voted in 2016, and we say, well, to what, how much are the parties up and down? There's awful. There's more here than you want to know. Uh, the bit you really need to know here is that amongst those people who voted Remain in 2016, your support in the recent opinion polls is on average down by seven points. You've lost one in three of your support. In contrast, amongst those who voted Leave, your support is up by four points. You've got up from three points to seven points. Now, there is a clear contrast between your experience, and I'm going to be emphasising this more than once, between your experience and that low party. You, both of you, at leadership level at least, have decided, until very recently, at least in the case of Labour, to keep stum about Brexit in the, in the belief and expectation that that was necessary in order to achieve an electoral advance because you need to reconnect with the voters. Now, in the case of the Labour Party, yes, they have, relatively speaking, gained ground amongst Leave voters, although it's more subtle than that, um, but they have also managed to gain ground amongst Remain voters. You've only managed to lose ground amongst Remain voters and win ground amongst Leave voters but the gain amongst the new voters is less than the losses amongst your main voters. Still, this is no longer the way you should be analysing it. Given that people have changed their attitudes, given that people have entered the electorate since 2016, what we should be doing is analysing this according to people's current views about Brexit. Now, in the case of the Labour Party, this already begins to make a difference. Um, Notice that uh, I said they have 53% of Remain voters, 30% of those who voted Leave. If you do it by current preference, actually Labour have got 56% of current uh, support amongst current rejoiners and tw only 26% 26 26 amongst those who'd want to stay out. So there's a lot going on with Labour about how actually in gaining ground, they've been gaining ground amongst people who used to believe in Leave and no longer do so, right? In your case, however, it doesn't make any difference. I still end up with the same answer of you losing more votes amongst rejoiners than you are gaining amongst those who stay out. Indeed, if I take that panel survey that I was referring to earlier, that very big 15,000 study, um, uh, that indeed suggests that maybe Labour are just doing equally well amongst both groups. Uh, that is an interesting finding itself. But you will see that in your case, if you look at it in terms of people's current preference, then basically the conclusion you would draw from this survey is you've used, lost a power load of Remain voters and frankly you've made very little progress at all amongst those who voted to stay out. Um, so what's going on here? Well, one of the things again I can do with British election study is I can break down um, the people who are still loyal to you the people who are no longer loyal to you, so the leavers here means people who've left the zone, it's not people who want to leave the EU. And on the right hand side, the folk whom you have attracted. Okay? And basically, it doesn't matter whether I do this analysis by 2016 vote, 2019 uh, belief about Brexit, or people's current uh, view about Brexit. Either way, right? The people who are loyal to you are overwhelmingly pro Remain, they are 90% pro Rejoin. <laughs> but notice the people whom you have lost are also almost as firmly pro rejoin. So you've been losing rejoin voters in spades. Yes, relatively speaking, the people whom you've attracted are less pro EU. Only about two thirds of them are in the in EU camp. So, yes, you've changed the character of your support to a degree. But I've already been saying, you're, this is gaining ground amongst a, um, what is proving now to be a diminishing asset. And this then is, uh, bring, brings together two threads that I've already talked about. So I've already talked about how you've been losing ground to Labour. I've shown you how you're losing Remain, Remain voters. These are the two things coming together. Where have those people who support Remain and who voted Liberal Democrat in 2019, where have they gone? 
Right, you can all see the answer. Three quarters of them have switched to the Labour Party. So again, a message here is that in thinking through your electoral strategy, you need to be aware you've got to fight not only the Conservatives, you've also got to think about how you avoid losing votes uh, to the Labour Party. Um, what I can also do, um, and again shows the contrast between you and Labour, um, this is breaking uh, the change in party support according to whether or not people are constantly pro-EU, those, those are the blue bars, the folk who voted to leave but are now in favour of rejoining, the folk who have moved in the opposite direction and then the yellow bars are the folk who are constant outs. Now, two things to note about Labour. One is they've basically made progress by more or less equal amounts amongst those who have been constant inners and constant outers. But where Labour have been particularly successful, probably despite their best endeavours, <laughs> has been amongst those people who have changed their minds about Brexit. The people who, so Labour, so the reason why the Labour's vote amongst people who want whose current preference is to be uh, outside the EU is lower than the 20, <coughs> their level among the 2016 vote, is because a quite a lot of the people who have moved from Conservative <coughs> to Labour have also changed their minds about Brexit. In your case, you can see you've lost a barrel load of people who are loyalists to being inside the EU. You've just about gained a little bit amongst those who are loyal to being outside the EU, but you are not doing particularly well even amongst those people who've changed their minds about Brexit. So the experience of the two opposition parties are, is different from each other, but in, 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 Labour can in a sense say, well, maybe not quite what we intended, but it's all worked out fine. In your case, perhaps there are more uh, 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 substantial questions to ask. Um, two other things, finally, because I can see Labour's beginning to get slightly achieved quite easily too. Um, we, uh, of course, uh, both opposition parties say, but hang on, it isn't just about leave voting, it's about geography. Um, and again, in Labour's case, they, they, they can point to evidence, as you can see here, uh, from the local elections, that, for example, as compared with uh, 2021, Labour's vote was on average up in six points in wards that were relatively pro-leave, and more or less twice the level as to what they were achieving in the less leave wards. But if you look at the far right-hand column, there's no evidence from the local elections that you are doing any better in leave areas than in remain areas. So whether you look at, 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 look at, at individuals or whether you look at aggregates, it, uh, it's not clear that the party is uh, gaining much benefit. Um, and then equally also, the other thing that I've done, um, yeah, which in a sense might be regarded as perhaps the market at which the keeping sturm about Brexit strategy was really aimed at, so I'm now looking at the change in party support, again using that wonderful 15,000 panel. These are constituencies that the Liberal Democrats won in 2010, but where a majority of people voted leave in 2016. What's happening to the Liberal Democrat vote? According, and I remember this survey is particularly pessimistic for you, but your vote's down by 10 according to this. Labour, up by 17. So I'm not going to say all this again. This is the conclusion. But... Um, it seems to me that, well, uh, it's not entirely clear so far that um, various things upon which the, uh, the party is assuming that it, will, it, it can it substantially uh, gain many more seats as a result of tactical voting. We have to be asked question marks about that. Uh, whether or not, indeed, this party is doing particularly well in the places where it's previously been strongest, there are question marks about that. And there are also question marks about whether or not this party, as opposed to Labour, have in fact managed to profit uh, from the stance it's decided, at least, level, at least uh, decided to do about Brexit. At the moment, if I were to characterise your electoral strategy, it's basically betting the farm on the Tories still being deeply unpopular. But you'll have to ask yourself whether or not it's a sufficient foundation for a general election strategy. slides up on the new Liberal Manifesto website for those of you who'd like to look at them in a bit more detail on. Well, thank you, Duncan. I'm, I was sure that was going to be a question if you hadn't said that. Um, thank you very much, Sir John. Write a reply. 
Thank you. <laughs> well, the answer to the question, should we be doing better, uh, is always the same. <laughs> <laughs> of course we should be doing better. So the question is, why are we not doing better and what do we do to do it right? Uh, and there are a lot of reasons uh, why we're not doing better. And I don't want for a minute uh, to suggest that a number of those reasons are unconnected to our own personal collective failings. But there has been a sea change in our position in British politics since we stopped being the third party. When I was Charles Kennedy's chief of staff, he had two questions a week to the Prime Minister that got covered every week. Ed has one question every five weeks. And this colours his ability to get coverage, not just then, but across the whole piece. And it's, it, it, we are all frustrated that we're not getting more media coverage. But when so much of the agenda starts, not least from the BBC, by what is happening in Parliament, this is like having a drag anchor uh, behind uh, you. And um, uh, John mentioned on a couple of occasions whether we do better than the SNP or not. That is a key, key thing um, at the next election in terms of our ability to promote ourselves. And in the uh, national, and in the absence of that guaranteed slot, um, the onus on promoting ourselves has increasingly fallen to what we do on the ground individually. The first opportunity in this parliament we had to make a big impression was in Cheshire. Uh, and I was very surprised the first night I went round that we were met with a, an inquisitorial interested air. I give the analogy, it was a bit like being a zebra turning up at your front door and people saying, I've never seen a zebra before. I've never seen life in a zebra. <laughs> Only on this case, I've never seen a zebra. What are you all about? And this is what I have found in by-election after by-election, local election after local election. It isn't that people have given up on us. It's that people have forgotten that we exist or have never spoken to somebody. I was in uh, Camusy on Thursday night in a by-election we got in Vauxhall and a chap in his 60s came to the door and he said, well, you've disappeared. I remember when that Mike Tuffery was a councillor, but we haven't seen you for 20 years. And the truth is, he hasn't. Because we were wiped out during the coalition. You all know, we've lived through it, a lot of you, how difficult it's been uh, to build back. Um, and now we're doing it, we're having to do what... Nicholas Sturgeon says was the key to SNP success, winning over people one by one because of what they see of us. And if they're not seeing much of us nationally, which they have not, um, this, what they see of us on the ground, is increasingly important. And you know, I don't want to big up too much what we've achieved, but those by-election victories are truly remarkable from a literally zero start. I mean, in Shropshire, to so 